Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to our winter webinars. Um, maybe not quite winter yet, but we're anticipating the season coming up. It's great to be back. It's our first webinar since July, um, and it's fantastic to see so many people joining us. Um, there's very nearly a thousand of you, and I think we will probably go over a thousand. So thank you for joining us. Uh, first things first, if you want to watch the webinar with live captions, please click the green button that's underneath us at, um, that says open live transcripts that will open the live captions in another window. Um, we um, are welcoming questions from the audience. Uh, there's another button at the bottom that says ask a question. Please post a question there for our speakers. I'll introduce you to those in a second. And we will try to answer as many of those questions as we can after hearing from Quinn and from Peter. Um, we can't promise to get to every single uh, question because uh, we, we do get a, a lot, but we'll try to answer as many of them as, as we can. Um, it's great to see so many of you introducing yourselves in the chat panel on the right hand side. So please say who you are, your union, your workplace, and exchange any tips and ideas there um, about, about what we're talking about. So, um, protecting mental health in the workplace is, as we know, um, a very important subject. And for the last 13 years, the TUC has been surveying safety reps and stress and mental health has come out as the most common concern every year that we've done this. Um, harassment is also a common concern and this is often the cause of stress. So we're going to be talking about this um, and, and our speakers are going to talk to us about ways that workplace reps can improve the situation for, for their members. So on to our speakers. Um, our first speaker is my colleague Quinn Roach. He is uh, from our Equalities Department and he is the Policy Officer for um, uh, disability issues and LGBT plus issues. We'll be hearing from him in a second. And we've also got Peter Kelly, senior psychologist from the Health and Safety Executive and also workplace rep at the HSE, uh, representing his colleagues with management. So we're going to go over to Quinn first to um, hear a little bit about um, this issue from the TUC's point of view. Quinn, over to you. Ah. Thank you, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. It's really a great pleasure to be here today and to see so many of you uh, in this room, over a thousand people, it's uh, absolutely incredible. Uh, so as Anna said, my name is Quinn Roach. I'm the TUC Policy Officer for LGBT Plus and Disabled Workers Policy, uh, and my pronouns are he, him. Uh, so mental health and stress is an area that sits really neatly between disabled workers policy and the work of my colleague, uh, Shelley, who's our health and safety officer. Uh, and Shelley is brilliant, but also in Amsterdam, uh, taking some well-deserved leave. So today I'll be talking to you about our approach to mental health in the workplace. Uh, but first, I think we should define it. So the World Health Organization says mental health is not just the absence of mental disorder. It's defined uh, as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. And so what that really means is we all have mental health, uh, just like we all have physical health, and sometimes we feel well, and sometimes we feel unwell. Um, and it's important to recognize that mental health is not just as important as physical health, uh, but equally, if not more, and can have a huge impact on our ability to participate in work and in every kind of element of society. Uh, our mental health can vary enormously as we go through life, and can be affected by a huge range of factors. And one of those factors is work. Uh, it's also important to recognize the scale of what we're talking about. So what we know is that one in four people will experience a mental health problem in any given year. And one in six workers are affected by conditions like anxiety, depression, and stress. So the relationship to the workplace is that a worker can be thriving in work, or they can be struggling in work, or they can be ill and possibly off work. Uh, and workers with poor mental health, including common mental health problems and severe mental health illness can be in any of these groups. So they can be thriving or uh, with the appropriate support they can thrive and without support they can be struggling or ill or off work and anyone can be in those locations. Um, but, but poor mental health, it, uh, like, um, having high levels of stress can lead to mental ill health, such as depression and anxiety. And this is a trade union issue. Um, 
So that's interesting, but you might be thinking, so what? So it's a TUC's position that workplaces should be places where you can thrive, uh, where employers try and eliminate the factors that cause you, the worker, to struggle or become ill. So employers being proactive can help ensure workers have good mental health and prevent workers from becoming ill. Um, and if we think about the social model of disability, and that's something the TUC has formally adopted, what we are saying is that workplaces, not workers, need to be adapted or fixed. What we're saying is that there are no jobs that cannot be done by disabled people. And rather, employers should make reasonable adjustments, reasonable adaptions to avoid disabling workers from particular jobs based on their impairment. And in this instance, the impairment would be um, poor mental health. So I just wanted to say that upfront and central. Um, my colleague Tanya might drop a link to a module we have on the social model of disability, which you can look at at any time, not necessarily now, but just to say that that's our approach to mental health and impact to all kinds of disabilities, that the workplaces need to be adapted to remove the barriers that prevent people from taking part. Um, now, we know removing the barriers, at, with mental health, we know that the barriers aren't being removed and that uh, workplaces cause poor mental health and those causes aren't being addressed by employers at the moment. So as Anna mentioned a moment ago, we know that in the last 13 years, the TUC has surveyed health and safety reps and stress has come up as a top and most common issue cited every single year. Um, and another common cause is harassment and that is also a cause of stress. Now, we're talking about the scale and so I think it's really important to be clear on that. So let's talk about uh, the labor force survey. So every year the labor force survey or every quarter puts out um, statistics on what's happening at work. Uh, and what we know is roughly 80% of non-disabled people of working age are in work. But when we look at the data and we look at it by kind of the archaic coding system that the labor force survey has, one of the things it looks at is depression and anxiety. And we know that only 45% of people who say they have depression and anxiety are employed. Uh, and we actually, when we cut it by kind of long-term mental illness or phobias, it's just 26.2% of people who are employed. And that's where it kind of um, those conditions or impairments are their main condition. So you, you see like, there's a massive disparity there. And so we as trade unionists need to be making sure employers address this seriously. So we have equal levels of participation in the labor force. Um, particularly where disabled people or people with mental health issues or problems want to be in work. So also I think it's really important to talk about what the common causes of stress and uh, stress, anxiety and depression in the workplace are, because I think we all would recognize them if we think about it. And it's just important to kind of pull them out specifically. So we know they are redundancies, reorganizations, overwhelming workloads, being expected to do more with less. And I think a lot of us in this kind of room will have heard that multiple times. Um, low paid jobs, uncertainty and zero hour contracts, and of course, discrimination in the workplace. So those are some of the common causes of stress and anxiety and depression. Uh, so what else do we know? Well, the government commissioned an independent report a while ago. It was called Thriving at Work. And, and what they found was that more people are in work with a mental health condition than ever before. Uh, it found that many individuals with mental health problems are struggling emotionally, off sick, less productive, or leaving employment. Uh, it also pointed out 300,000 people with a long-term mental health condition leave employment every year. And if you're wondering roughly what that's equivalent to, that's equivalent to the whole population of Newcastle or Belfast. So it's massive. Um, it also found that around 15% of people at work have symptoms of an existing mental health condition. So it, it's absolutely gargantuan and huge. And the report also did another thing, and it's something that this government really pay attention to. Uh, it monetized the cost of not addressing mental health at work. So what it found was that the cost to employers of not addressing mental health properly was between 33 billion and 42 billion every year. It found the cost to the government was between 24 and 27 billion, and the cost to the economy as a whole was between 74 billion and 94 billion pounds a year. So. These are big numbers. I mean, they're so big, I can't really even imagine them. Now, it also pointed out that 33 billion of the cost is coming from presenteeism. So that's where individuals are less productive due to poor mental health in work. 
and they continue to come in even though they should be recovering. Um, so, you know, that's huge. But the report also found that the average return of one pound spent on addressing poor mental health and work was around four pound 20 in savings. So there's a real monetary reason to address poor mental health. Um, and, and, you know, we as trade unions must be aware of this and we will encourage employers to, to take it seriously and to deal with poor mental health in a, in a way that addresses the issues. However, what we are seeing at the moment is an escalation uh, of programs that employers are paying for, paying good money for, that do not go to addressing the barriers or the causes of, of stress and poor mental health. Um, and this is where we as trade unionists need to focus on. Um, what we're seeing is employers, rather than trying to reduce stress, um, introduce what they call things like stress management programs, uh, which aren't anything to do with preventing stress or, or poor mental health. Um, you know, what these things do is that they, don't, they do not change the workplace. They do not look to address the things that are causing stress. They try and change the worker. And that is not something that we are in support of. Um, and these programs typically have three parts. There are things like counseling, and that's aimed at helping employees cope and return to work. Uh, there are things like um, general training on how to deal with stress, uh, and then employer stress management programs like well-being initiatives. As I said, um, they don't do what we need, which is to address the causes of stress. Um, and so although employers are accepting there is a stress problem, they're not really saying it's what I have done to my worker that is the problem. Um, and I think when, when we talk about these programs, there's one that I always like to be specific about because I know many people are experiencing them at work at the moment, and that's resilience programs. So resilience is based on the idea that through training and personal development, workers can be taught to bounce back from adversity or change. And, you know, what it says is your tank, your individual personal tank of resilience is not topped up and we can teach you to make the tank bigger or to fill the tank up with gas. But it doesn't say that we will address the issues that are causing your poor mental health. So when we kind of, when I talk about this mental health, I just like to point these things out. Um, you know, and if you, if you hear resilience <laughs> mentioned in your workplace, I think this is the thing you need to think this is not changing workplace practice. This is trying to change me a worker and that's not right. So the TUC, we have made recommendations on how to address work, uh, mental health in the workplace and kind of stress. And those are things like addressing stigma because we know there's a massive stigma around mental health, uh, creating a workplace wellbeing policy, um, putting in place reasonable adjustments for mental health, uh, adjusting sickness and absence policies. So mental health is recorded poor mental health, absence linked to poor mental health is recorded somewhere separately. So it doesn't affect your kind of HR triggers. Um, and of course, we we'll always say consulting with staff who have experienced ill mental health about what those issues in the workplace are. Um, so those are just kind of some of the things I wanted to say to set the scene before we hand it over to our next speaker, um, before we go over to Peter, but hopefully that helps to kind of set the stall of what trade unions think we should be doing and we can take some questions afterwards. Absolutely. Thank you, Quinn. And just before um, I hand over to Peter, um, just to address a couple of the questions that have already been posted. Yes, we are recording this webinar. If you've registered for the for it, we'll be sending you a link to the recording by the end of today, along with any web links to um, resources that we that we've mentioned uh, so please don't worry and yes you are allowed to share the recording i've just seen that question pop up as well um so uh quinn uh referenced um again the issue of how big mental health is at work and we have shared some links to resources that can help workplace reps in supporting their members with these issues but before we talk we, we take any more questions i'm just going to hand over to peter um to talk us through um, the HSC's perspective on this. Peter, over to you. Hi, thank you very much. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, I've been at HSC 23 years. I've been a union member for 22 of those and a senior trade union rep for the last 15 years uh, uh, with Prospect. So I am sitting amongst comrades and I'll be very open and honest with you and candid in my conversations. But before we do that, I'd like to quickly take us through 
where we find ourselves in the current situation with COVID-19 uh, in terms of, uh, let's see, I need to share a window, so the presentation, uh, we bear with me, document. Huh. Right, I might not be able to share a presentation, but we'll carry on. Peter, if you can't share it, send it over to us and we'll send yeah. it out to people afterwards. Okay, that's fine. Right. I mean, it was, it was, uh, if you bear with me just for a second, just to see, if um, it should actually pop up now if I if I make a picture of it there. Do, do, do. Right, there we go. Share. Okay, let's go to the top. Is that working? Right, can you can you see just an acknowledgement that you can see I can't see so. Yeah, we can see it. I've just okay. put it up. So the changing landscape of mental health in a post pandemic era. What we know is coronavirus is here and it's highly linkable and it moves across organizations and countries at a frightening pace. The other thing that we really do know, and we know this from the World Health Organization and from uh, all, a number of governments and a number of regulators, is that the virus impacts people's mental health. This is illustrated here by uh, the COVID-19 virus and the, the impact on, on people's mental health. And that is principally because people want to get back to have a normal life. What do we know? What do we mean by a normal life? Well, that may fundamentally change the way offices are, are, are put together, the way factories are set out, will all change because of this pandemic. And it may take a period of time before they go back to some form of normality, or they may not go back to normality. And I think that's the, the important thing. You know, flexible working used to be a, a major issue as a trade union rep to get for your for your members. Now, um, you know, the arguments have been pretty much set about flexible working arrangements. What I want you to do is quickly just look at this, and and this really is a um, is a used uh, for training special forces. So these are the Green Berets, SAS, and it talks about what happens when people go into a conflict zone. But it's a really useful way of also explaining what's been happening with people's mental health as we've gone through COVID-19. This was given to me by a, a special forces um, captain who, who said, if you look at the, the yellow line, Peter, and you look at that's really um, what we, this, this first curve is the start of the pandemic and it's wave one. And I want you to notice the line, the beginning of the new challenge. That's when people begin to be impacted by their mental health, about the possibility that something's coming, that we might be going into lockdown. Um, but actually, it was a slow uptake uh, initially, but then we got to the top. Um, this is around about March, mid-March, and then we were asked to uh, um, to move into, uh, uh, you know, to working from home or, or um, you know, to stay at home, to stay safe. And then we go into this adaptive zone. Uh, now, this is very common in, 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 uh, in conflict situations where people go in, they adapt to the, the new way of, of where they are. But what I'd like you to notice is the line, the, the checkered line that's up on the right hand side. That's the reaction that people were having on their mental health as they were coming out. It was a much more instant reaction. It was less, de less delayed and very steep and very sharp. Now, what we know is after each sub subsequent wave that's come along is that the right hand curve is people's experience, not the left hand curve, because people are, um, you know, have gone through significant cha challenges and difficulties as, uh, as they've gone through it. So really, we know from uh, evidence and we know from research that actually pandemics will induce mental health, recessions induce mental health. What we've never had is a combination of both. And that's what we've got at the moment. And if you were to think about the analogy of the perfect storm, if you think about the film, the, uh, the storm where George Clooney is uh, is in the boat, the boat is the, is the pandemic. The people in it are the, where, you know, the, the people are the recession. But the great massive wave is what we're looking at, which is a mental health, emerging mental health crisis that's not just going to last for a year, but will have a generational impact on people. So we have to be... Uh, uh, taking this seriously um, because what we've really been trying over a period, long period of time is we've done, we want people to socially distance but then we've actually created social disconnection and people don't feel able to, to contact and we need to look and get better at you know supporting our members um, and supporting individuals to break down this social disconnect if we were to look at COVID-19 these are the six management standards which are touch on briefly uh, in, a, in, a, in a moment. Demands, control, support, relationship, role and change. 
which of those six so six sources of stress are prominent in a pandemic okay prior pre pre pandemic high demands low control low support would be where the bulk of the cases would be found on work related stress okay um now what we've found in the pandemic is you've got high demands a pandemic take, takes away all control the support has felt has fallen through the uh, you know, to the just through through the gaps, people don't feel their support. Relationships have been sh strained. Their um, people are not sure what their role is because their role was constantly changing as they were asked to go into different forms of lockdown, and that's led to masses of change. So we are looking at uh, a significant period, which is why the World Health Organization and others like myself are saying that this is a generational issue. We are going to have to deal with the legacy of this pandemic for many years to come, and we need to be doing that. Why? Because I just want you to refer back to the, the stats we, we put out. The stats we put out, the last stats we put out was was 17.9 million days lost to work-related stress, 828,000 people off with work-related stress, okay? That was one week into the pandemic, one week into the pandemic. I hazard a guess that when the, the, the stats that come out, uh, which are at, at the end of this year or, uh, or the start of next, um, we could be looking at um, you know a substantial increase on that. We could be looking at nearly 20 million days lost to work-related stress, depression, and anxiety, and up to a million cases. Um, it remains to be seen, but um, you know all the all that I see before me suggests that it, there's going to be a huge impact. And what's the current position? With what the the stress and depression and anxiety, particularly work-related stress, is covered under uh, the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974, um, which is uh, Section 2, um, which re requires you, you to protect your workers from both physical and mental um, mental health issues. Um, it, does, it implicitly covers all health issues. It doesn't just say physical. Uh, and then there's the management reg. reg. Reg 3 requires you to do a risk assessment, and Reg 5 requires you to act upon that risk assessment so earlier in the in before i saw a comment saying that um risk assessment a tick box exercise they're not a tick box exercise they're a duty and a requirement on the employer you know as an as a as a as a union as a union rep these are the things that i'm going to ask for you know have you done a risk assessment as a, as a health and safety inspector who specializes in, in stress and mental health, you've got to show me you've done a risk assessment. You've got to show me that you've done something about the risk assessment. If you've not done anything about the risk assessment, then that's a breach of Reg 3. If you've not done the risk assessment, then that's, a, sorry, that, that's a breach of Reg 5. If you've not done, done a risk assessment, then that's where Reg 3 comes into place. So just be clear that, you know, that the legislation does allow us to act. And it's, what we do is do the five steps of risk assessment, and it's about continuous improvement. This is, um, and we do this for and that is for, for work-related stress because that's the management standards approach. And then we have facilitated a HSC talking toolkit, which allows you as trade union reps and managers to have conversation with uh, with employees. So that's just a, a, a quick set of slides to go through. So I should have been, I should have, Stop sharing. Yeah, um, so, could you just confirm that I've stopped sharing? Yep. All good. All right. And I want to share something with you, which is actually frustrating me because I've spent 20 years training every HSE uh, inspector in, in, in this particular thing is what we need for a case. Okay. So, what we need for a case um uh, and i think you have they have they been sent this link already or um can, can, can you remind me no probably not if you uh, have a link we'll send it out afterwards but if, if you tell me now i, I can post it up in the, in the chat okay. what it is as well i think i'm going to i'm going to share entire screen so i may share my entire screen at the moment yeah share right because i'm just going to take you to this right they should be up in front of you yeah uh, so, can you see HSC will consider investigating concerns about work-related stress? Is that up? Yep, all good. All good. All right. I've even made it, I've highlighted it in red. <laughs> so, these are the three elements that we need for, to, to look at a case. There is evidence in red that a number of staff are currently experiencing work-related stress. 
and stress related ill health okay so it's not individual cases if you were going to do a case work and you were taking a personal case you would bring the evidence you that you've got to support your members argument that that uh, against the, the grievance uh, that, that, that that's been put forward i and we expect a similar level of evidence hsc is where hsc is not the appropriate body to investigate so, so concerns solely related to individual cases such as bullying harassment because as uh, under the current uh, the current scenario that's not covered by hsc it's covered by the department for trade or, or it's it's recent and uh, recently been changed but if there is evidence of wider organization failing there is evidence of a number of staff then we may consider but we would expect that you would have raised already with the employer and for the employer to be given sufficient time to respond accordingly these are the three elements that need to be there so there are a number of staff there are wider organizational failings and there is evidence of that and the employer has been told and has failed to has failed to react and failed to respond um and uh that that should take me back uh okay looks like we've just lost peter for a second uh hopefully he'll rejoin uh in a moment um i think maybe it, yeah he's his uh connection has just has just wobbled for a, for a second but I'll jump in um, and put a couple of the questions to Quinn that we've had sent in in advance and that have been posted during the webinar um, there's a lot of people saying um, are they going to get copies of the resources yeah absolutely if you I'll just repeat again if you have registered for this event we'll send you a link to the recording and to any um, any resources that that we've mentioned right um oh peter's back um, i just <laughs> i just jumped in there because we lost you for a minute um just to say we could um jump to a couple of the questions that we've had no, sent in in advance let, let's go for them um Excellent. Just, just to give you context right for 23 years i have promoted and pushed mental health within uh, hsa and within government and um i've trained all hsc's inspectors the last nine years around this area okay so if i speak to you i speak to you with confidence about what we need to, for cases um and i must say and I, i've said this before some of the stuff that i've got through makes it extremely difficult to take a case and actually i am by highlighting in red i'm trying to give you as much direction as you can to give hsc the opportunity um to investigate thanks peter um i hope hopefully now we can get on to some of we can talk about some of the, the actual um like practical issues that reps face in this yeah. area um so the first question actually that we've had sent in advance i'm going to put to quinn um quite a few people have posted questions about how we collectivize this issue um and it's obviously we talk about mental health stress etc so how how can we collectivize the issue um as a trade union issue in the workplace rather than it be seen as individual cases um in reference to perhaps what peter has just said quinn um i think that's really um i'm you can hear me right <laughs> great sorry everyone who can't really remember yeah i think that's a really good uh question so i think one of the resources that TUC has created is a mental health workbook. Um, I, I'll ask my colleague to pop that into the link, which really takes us through the issues in workplaces and how to collectivize it. But I think knowing that it's not an individual issue, that um, branch people, you know, the reps on branch should be looking for wider issues are important. And if, as we just saw from Peter's um, three points it's about kind of being able to say that this is not just an individual issue this is a collective issue this affects many workers so getting the evidence for that is important but also just going up to you know when you're negotiating with your employers and pointing out that some things are not appropriate like resilience is not appropriate that you need to change workplace culture i think that's that's the key and it's it's really about having the evidence to prove that they should be addressing those things mindfulness was absolutely not beneficial during your lockdown <laughs> no matter how mindful you were and how resilient you were it didn't matter and that is what because it was based at the individual level yeah. i won't talk about mindfulness and resilience when people ask me i'll talk about organizational resilience 
and I'll talk about organizational mindfulness. And what are those, what an organization should be doing? You want your people to be mindful, make your, your organization mindful. If you want them to be resilient, make your organization resilient to changes um, and, and how you support people going forward. So um, I'm, I've noticed a couple of questions I'm really keen to, to get in there and... Uh, well, it kind of links up to one of the other questions that's come in um, that is, is to say, what does our panel think of mental health first aiders? Um, Quinn, do you want to go first? And then I'll pass on to Peter, Quinn, from, from the TUC perspective. Yeah, from the TUC perspective, and I'm fairly certain we'll be aligned on this, mental health first aiders are in principle a good idea, but what we have not seen is any evidence that they're making a real difference in the workplace. Um, so it's great that people want to be more aware of mental health, but what we as a trade union want to see is people not being aware, uh, people being aware and employers taking actions to address poor mental health. And that's kind of what we're not seeing with mental health first aiders at the moment. And I think we've got a long kind of standing concern about the lack of evidence to show their impact. Thanks, Quinn. Uh, any thoughts, Peter? Yeah, well, considering I helped write a report about mental health first aid, you know what my position is going to be on this. Um, I actually get, I actually met with mental health first aid and I said, look, 20 years ago or 10 years ago, I would give my right arm to have 750,000 people trained on mental health. And I still would. My issue is that the training alone without the, 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 the what we would call the primary or the organisational changes is not enough because um, I've seen people who do mental health first aid who themselves, because of exposure to really quite sometimes very traumatic cases of, of listening to their colleagues, there's no support systems that are in place for them. So mental health first aid, training people, yes, it's support, but that, but to go and, if you turn around to me and say, I've got a mental health first aid course and I've done a staff wellbeing survey, it doesn't fly my boat because it, it doesn't actually meet the requirements of the legislation, but it is good that there are, these people but what it what isn't good is we're not doing anything about it now i challenge mfa to go and do an evaluation study and they have and they and they they shortly to report on on on, on the support i also said actually be honest and open about where it came from it came from a community based intervention in australia i know the the lad that developed it in australia and i know where the origins of it was and i think it's great to have information but it's not it's not the be on end all because actually you're more vulnerable. Get this, you are more vulnerable from a foreseeability perspective if you don't do anything with the person that you've been told has has a problem. They're not thought that one through, have we? When we when we when we proposed it. Yeah, yeah and just to say, there's um, I, just to tag on, there's a really good article by our former health and safety officer uh, Hugh Robertson. Yeah. I think somewhere on the TUC's website, which kind of goes into more detail about the concerns we have as well. You, you might you might see some of my thoughts in there. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely dig that out. I remember it from a few years ago, but we'll definitely dig that out and make sure it's included in our resources list. Um, right, okay. Can I say though, they there are seven hundred fifty thousand people that did uh, have knowledge that didn't have knowledge before. So let's be let's see the positive in the fact that they have knowledge. What it has highlighted is where the system is is failing, which is why we have seventeen point nine million days, eight hundred twenty eight thousand people off. We're not tackling this at a systemic level. And as the trade union reps, we're almost passing ourselves into it to go, oh, it's too hard, or actually, um, you know, no one's going to do anything about it. Uh, I don't believe that. Uh, and, and the reason I don't believe it is because I'm still here after 20 years. I'm 54 and I have to do this for another 13 years. And my message will, will be exactly the same until we actually come together to tackle this at an organisational level. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's been a few comments saying that M uh, MHFA, it's again, it tries to change the work and not the workplace. Um, and that's a message that you've, you've um, told us is is something that we, 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 should, we shouldn't be doing, Quinn. Um, OK, just on to another question here. Uh, Quinn, to you first. What more does the TUC want to see in terms of enforcement uh, when it comes to work that can cause stress? and other mental health, mental ill health um, conditions. So in terms of, of regulation, I think what we'd like to see is probably a bit more of a hands-on approach from the HSE. Um, they are the regulator in this area. Um, so, you know, it's their job to investigate, regulate, and enforce 
when it comes to workplace risks. And obviously mental health is a workplace risk. Um, but I wouldn't say that without pointing out also the fact that over the last 10 years, I believe their budget's been cut by 50%. So yes, what are, you know, one of the, what are, what are the stresses I talked about earlier is doing more with less. And so I think there comes a time when you can only do less with less. And what we'd really like to see is a, a properly funded HSE. Um, but, you know, there's only so much that reps can do in reality. So, you know, we'll continue to do what we can do. We can campaign, we can hold employers to account, and we can take industrial action. But we'd like to see more kind of direct enforcement from HSE when it comes to mental health issues. Yeah, um, I, I totally accept that. Um, one of the reasons why I've trained all of our recent inspectors, um, I have a cohort of senior inspectors that I've trained at a, a greater level, is to get a case to get cases actually where we where we can act upon and that so that uh clarification that i just gave you there which will be sent out to you it are the, are the agreed terms on which we will take we, we will take a case right um i'm as a trade union rep i've done conferences with a number of you um from a range of unions um and and you know and uh, and I've, I've come across the same thing which is well you know what are you going to do my, my my argument to you is well, what are you going to do okay how are you going to come back to me with cases that are robust and strong? Yeah, and I would I would ask you to when you're coming to present what these cases are, present them like a, a case that you're doing for one of your members. You provide give the evidence that we need that allows us to make a judgment call uh, uh, as to what we will do, um, and 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 that uh, that and I have seen some excellent examples of that. Uh, I've also seen some poor examples where people just assume by telling this without giving us evidence we're going to do something and we have to we need the evidence and that's why I put the criteria you know the criteria is there and that's why I've highlighted in red what for me are the lines that I look for okay so and then we can work our way through that and come back with a collective you know if you come back with collective agreement or a collective issue uh, and you can you can show evidence that sequencing those three elements then that's going to be a stronger position uh, for, an for, the, for the purpose of investigation. That's really helpful, Peter. Thank you. Have you got any, um, just extending on from that question, on any advice or guidance on, on gathering that evidence in the workplace? Like, have you got two or three examples of, of what reps could use for that? Yeah, I'm just, you know, it's ironic, but really. use the staff surveys where they show they've got a problem. That's your first point of call. Okay, as a trade union rep, ask where those locations are. Do further investigations in those locations. If you have a set of cases in there, go, okay, so in this particular session, there are 100 people that work here and we've got 10 people off with work related stress. That's not one individual that's got a problem. That's an organizational issue, isn't it? So look at the data that you've got, which, which would lead you in a direction. You know, um, I, it's a wonderful thing. I mean, we need to realize that. I know sometimes we don't support a staff service, but you need to remember a staff survey can be a very good indicator, a surrogate indicator of where the problems are. And also, it is a duty to do a risk assessment. Not a nice to, I know someone said my, my, my HR department didn't even know. Well, they, they need to know because it's built into that. And if you're in a larger organization, use 45,003, um, the ISO standard, which I was a, a part of the, uh, the, um, the experts to develop that, that actually gives you a safety management system around psychological health and safety. And embedded in it is what? The management standards, primary, secondary, tertiary, primary organization secondary is what we do to train our managers to be better managers and our well-being initiatives tertiary mindfulness resilience all of that you're treating at the bottom level yeah absolutely you answer that question but i kind of but be look around the data that you've got you've got plenty of sickness absence data uh you know uh, at levers data all of that is indicative of you know because that's the kind of stuff that i'll be looking at by doing an investigation, there be the questions I'm asking. Um, that's really helpful, Peter. Thank you. Um, I think it's just worth reiterating something you referenced there, that it's the employer's duty to do the risk assessment in the workplace, obviously not, not union reps. Uh, union reps can um, talk about it to management. They can hold management to account on these issues, but obviously they're not responsible for undertaking the risk assessment themselves. Um, 
something that uh, uh, that popped up in the chat panel while you were both talking there is do we either the TUC or the HSC have any examples of workplaces who have tackled these issues successfully um, because people have said it would be really uh, helpful to have case studies where we could uh, that we could cite as being um, you know wh where, where it's worked. Quinn do you know if we've got any? Um, I can't think of any off the top of our head. We do have that really good workbook I mentioned earlier which might have examples of best practice but if you leave it with me I can take it back and see if we would have anyone that we would recommend as being really on top of it. Fantastic mm -hmm. we, yeah we'll, we'll definitely look into that. What about the HSE? We have case studies, yeah, on our website, um, which um, and we've we're just updating those those websites. Um, and I've actually, you know, on the the, ret the return on investment. That was a terrible thing to talk about, but actually, the return on investment argument um, is huge. And this is where actually investing in well being, we can directly show a correlation in people's reduced sickness absence. Well being, not just being massaging your head and giving you you know some apples and oranges it's about structurally looking at the way your work is is managed and processed i went into a biscuit factory a couple of years back and uh, they were having a massive sickness absence and i looked at this uh it's conveyor belt and these biscuits were going along and i said how many biscuits go along in a in a, in a, in a shift because you have to pick up three biscuits put it into a plastic gillet and there's a uh, three gillets so it's nine biscuits and they said oh, no idea we, we we just produced the biscuits and the staff picked them up well, I worked out over a course of a seven and a half, seven hour shift and 10 minutes because they used to move one person down the line, not even one person off the job, just one person down the line on, on a, a line of nine people. You'd 17,000 repetitive movements. And I said, well, slow the, slow the conveyor belt down by 30 seconds and you, you're going to actually, um, you're still going to get the same amount of, uh, you're going to get the sort of um, people through. But they said, yeah, but we're, we're going to lose you know, eight, uh, two percent, two percent of the product, and I said, "Well, you're losing twenty percent on sickness acceptance already." It was because they're not thinking about the person in the system. We've designed these systems which are actually way beyond the capabilities of the individual. Uh, so I'm gonna, sorry, that's I, I have these Hyde Park moments where I go off. So you just have to bear with me. Um, but the point thing it's it's it well being is not just exclusively about the nice things it's about looking at work and seeing how work and people interact i'm sorry you know you got high demands yeah you got high demands because something's going wrong not because your people are ill or your people are, are slow you've got something that's and you and actually as trade union reps you need to present the evidence to say here's your sickness absence here's this but here's our solution yeah thanks peter um a question about a different issue now um the uh hsc stress management standards that i think you referred to earlier are a really useful tool um that have been proven to reduce stress levels among the workforces but we've seen evidence that not many employers are using them yeah. why do you think that is and what could be done about that well there's a huge campaign that's starting next month um which will which is going to look at stress and mental health and it'll be, it'll be at the center of the of um a, a large communications program the other thing is you as reps and me as a as a rep and also as a as special inspector should be asking the questions you know where's your risk assessment um it is and i have been involved in every notice that we've issued on this yeah and they've all been issued on two principles they the risk assess and then which is uh, and which which is reg three and reg five um, and compliance is actually about what you do to tackle the risk that you've identified. Um, I have had people say, well, I've done a staff survey. And, and you yeah, have done a staff survey. And my question to you is, if there's a massive 100 kilo gas bottle in your building, would you do a staff survey on it? You'd do a risk assessment, wouldn't you? Why are you not doing risk assessments? Why are they not? The, the, the adage that you, oh, I don't know, doesn't apply as trade union reps. Uh, as safety reps, you can be going back and say the expectation from HSC and the Health and Safety Work Act and the management race is a risk assessment should be done. Did that answer the question? It, I think it, it, it definitely gave us some, uh, gave reps some useful um, evidence to put to their uh, employer, to their organisation in cases where uh, management aren't following those 
guidelines. Um, okay, we've had quite an interesting question about performance culture. Quinn, I wondered what your thoughts were on this, that um, we know that performance culture can create perpetual stress from the worry um, of underperforming, losing one's job. Have you got any advice about how this could be challenged collectively? Um, because I think it's it's a, it's an issue that isn't just going to affect one person, it's going to affect quite a lot of people in the workplace. I think it's a really good question. Do I have any actual tactical advice on this at this point? No, <laughs> I'll have to give <laughs> okay. it a thought and be completely blunt and honest. Um, but I did want to pick up on something that I've seen bubbling in the chat, um, which I've seen a lot of, uh, of those listening really focusing on mental health first aiders. Like it, it's just been bubbling since Peter and I have mentioned it. And I just want to say that for me, mental health first aiders reminds me very much of unconscious bias training, um, which is to say something that swept through the equality arena and has no benefit that we can see. Um, so just to say like, you know, there are great things about it and I don't want to keep this going, but we're not seeing anything to show that it has an impact, just like unconscious bias training. And that might've been my way of just saying that to the 1,031 people in here, if you've had unconscious bias training, that is also not necessarily effective. Can I just comment here, right? Um, your Some of the comments here are actually playing into management. Risk assessments are not updated, they're not useful, they're a tick box exercise, everything. This is the language that management use, okay? At the heart of it, if I go in and there's no, there, there is no guarding on a machine, I want to know where the risk assessment is for why there's no guarding on that machine. And it is exactly the same for mental health and stress. What do you do? And I sometimes illustrate this. What we're trying to do is to put a guarding between the job and the individual. And that guarding is that protective measure of making sure that people's mental health and that their, 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 their stress is actually managed, yeah? It is written into health and safety law. It isn't just a nice thing, it's written very clearly into health and safety law that the requirement is there, um, you know? And yes, the, there is a requirement to do action plans. What's he doing a risk assessment? You don't do any actions. How do you prove you've you've actually done what you, know, you need to do? You know, and I, so, um, sorry if that's a bit of a challenge, but I think, um, I think we have to go back to as as reps, as trade union reps, as, is to go back to where we were first came into this was to 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 look after the workers, both their physical and their mental environments. Yeah, and that means we use the tools that we have. Uh, I say forty five thousand and three. I can talk to TUC about that, but um, and and um, in terms of you know. For us, it gives you the safety management system that you've always wanted for psychological health and safety. And, and it's there. And because I argued with them, it's there free because uh, unless you earn over 25 million, which in, 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 which, in which case you can afford to pay the, the price for the, for the full document. But I, you know, I, I made an argument specifically because I wanted this available to, to people to start putting in and addressing these questions about whether or not a risk assessment should or shouldn't be used and not being addressed it's all in that but at the heart of it the management standards gives you that risk assessment basis thanks peter um can you explain to us a little bit please about what kind of action the hsc can take and how they're able to enforce uh, workplace impact on mental health um yeah. in in employers who are, are failing in this duty yeah, so the, the, so the failure in the duty is uh, will be section two, so uh, of the of Redgrave, which I have here because I'm a geek. <laughs> okay, and, and 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 then Reg three, Reg five, and Reg seven. Now, I would ask you as trade union reps to be familiar with each of these regulations. Re um, section two requires the duty the duty is on the employer to manage the risk to their health and safety. Okay, it just it didn't say um, their physical health, just it's their health and safety. And that's the premise of, of, of the act, you know, that we want to protect people's health and safety. The reg three, very clear that you're required to do a risk assessment. Reg five requires you to act upon the knowledge that you have. Reg seven 
actually comes into play if you know you've got some information and you've not shared that with relevant people. And it, the, the management records is a beautiful piece of legislation that if it, that has options uh, from a regulatory perspective. But to get to that position, we need to know that we need and we need clear, clear line of direction that um, you've gone through the three principles. One case um, ha is not enough. Because you could argue, if you go into there, well, this one person just wasn't coping, they weren't doing very well. Okay, I know, I know that's a very simplistic way of saying it, but actually, you bring me 10, 10 plus cases or whatever, and 10 an arbitrary number, you know, but you bring me cases where actually we've been told, then I would ask the question, once you knew, what did you do? Um, and, and the frustrating thing is, as a trade union what, rep, for for years, I've watched this slip back into, oh, we're not going to do anything about it. And actually, we can do something about it. But when you're going to look at stress cases, when you're going to look at mental health, look at it like a personal casework, right? I am ruthless in my personal casework. I get every ounce of evidence I can to make sure my member is supported when I'm going to when I'm going to go into a meeting. You need to do the same when um, when, when you're uh, you know when when you when you you come with a, a collection of cases and you forward it to the uh, the contact centre and then they go through a criteria which is, which is based on these three elements plus others and then at that point it may get allocated to an inspector. Ultimately, most of the cases, all of the cases, do come eventually via my desk. Thanks, Peter. Um, I think we've probably got time for one more question. I'm just That's scanning so down the list here of what we have and haven't covered because we've had a lot of questions here and I'm trying to group them together so that we cover as many things as possible. Um, right. OK. Um, have you got any advice for how we can encourage employers to deal with mental health complexities in the workplace without them becoming overly defensive about their organisation? Um, so, for example, the, the example that the, the questioner has asked is that their organisation did not think mental health uh, could be considered a hidden disability and neither did some of their colleagues. Quinn, have you got any thoughts on that? I know we, we've done some work on hidden disabilities before. Um, have you got any thoughts about how it relates to this particular issue? Um, yeah, so invisible impairment is uh, the term that we would use now, because I think hidden disability infers that someone is taking an active role to hide something. So just to say, we would usually say uh, invisible impairment. Um, there are lots of invisible impairments uh, mental health is one of them, um, energy limiting chronic illness is another. Um, so the advice would be that they exist and they should be doing something to address them. And there are different tools that they can use to kind of capture what those actions are. Um, so, so I'm coming at this from a specific disability angle at the moment. So we have produced something called the Reasonable Adjustments Disability Passport, which looks to capture um, the agreements between the manager and the member of staff or the or the worker on how to adapt the workplace. So that's what I would be looking to do if I had a kind of invisible impairment. And actually, I do have a I do have an invisible impairment as someone who is dyslexic, and I do have a reasonable adjustments disability passport just to ensure that I continue to have the same level of adaptions to the workplace. Thanks, Quinn. That also gives some information. We had a question about uh, reasonable adjustments as well. So hopefully that information there can link up to that question. Uh, Peter, any thoughts on that as well? Just ask me the question again, because I got lost in the comments. I'm like, oh, I'm no worries. Uh, and, where and are we? Claire Walsh, I'll be in touch. Um, OK, how do we encourage employers to deal with mental health complexities without them becoming defensive? The example that the questioner uses is that um, whether mental health can be uh, considered a hidden disability or, as, as Quinn said, an invisible impairment, and neither did some of um, their colleagues. So when employers are defensive, really, about mental health as an issue. 
Well, after 12 months, it's, it's covered on the Equalities Act, as, um, as, as we're all aware. Um, you know, and uh, to be honest, most employees that don't tackle this will probably be looking at six to 12 months before their people return to work, if they ever return to work, because it goes down to about 1% 1, 1 return after six months. So um, hidden impairment, I know it's fully out there, isn't it? It's not hidden. If people are depressed, and pretty, I'm sure it's fairly, it, it is out there. And I don't think we should we should run away from it. It's a, um, it almost buys into the stigma argument, doesn't it? Actually, that actually people uh, should be should be ashamed with the depression and anxiety. And I don't think I'm dyslexic and dyspraxic, but I have also suffered from anxiety for twenty years. But I still stand up before you um, as someone that's Kate, you know, does does the job that I do, and I'm very proud of the fact that I can talk openly about my own mental health. Um, nothing to be embarrassed about. I'm a psychologist. I've got two degrees. Surely if anyone should be able to get their head sorted out around this, it's, it should be me, shouldn't it? Um, and, it and it actually, I, you know, my anxiety and my mental health is part of who I am. It's a journey that I'm on with. And, you know, and I, and I think that's really important. I will be very open with people about where, where I'm at because I think we've got to break down this stigma. And I know we need to leave in the next couple of minutes. But my plea, guys, seriously. This is a generational issue. And if we as trade union reps cannot get up and stand up and actually start and, and look at this area, then we're, we're really going to miss out supporting our members in the way with the way they do it. And, as a, and, as, and certainly as, a, as someone who's been promoting this for a long time, um, I don't want to be here in 13 years doing this. Honestly, I want us to be tackling the seminal occupational health issue of the, this generation. It was an issue before, but it's, it's it's it ain't going away just because we we finished off the pandemic and we're coming out of recession. Absolutely, Peter. I think that's a really key point. Um, the pandemic has perhaps brought some of these issues to the forefront of the discussion uh, more quickly than. Uh, they would have done without the pandemic, but they they were there before the pandemic, and they're still with us. And it's absolutely something that needs to be tackled. Um, yeah, we do have to finish shortly. Um, it's very nearly two o'clock. Um, just quickly to say that the TUC is launching a new reps training course within the next uh, two months, I think. Um, it's called From Resilience to Resistance, um, Supporting Members with Mental Health Issues in the Workplace. Um, we did post a link to it a bit further up, but the chat is sort of ticking by. But we'll make sure it's included in the um, resources email. Uh, yeah, watch this space. Well, it, it's going to be a great course for any, any safety rep so all that uh, remains for me to say is thank you very much to Quinn and to Peter for joining me today for a really great discussion about mental health in the workplace. As um, one of the viewers just posted, 1,034 people have taken time out of their day to discuss this. Um, and it's a really, really important subject. So thank you. Um, one, one last thing. Yeah, go just, for it. Ask, just ask the question. If you're looking at people and they're not there and something's not right, just go and ask them how they're traveling, yeah? Honestly, you do not know the difference between asking that one question. Don't ask them if they're fine because they'll tell you they're fine. Just ask the question, how are you traveling between one and ten? Just get out there and ask the question because there are people that and there are our members who need to have those conversations with us as, as reps. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's great advice to finish on. Um, so take care, everybody. We are back. I think next week with our next webinar in our autumn winter series. So do tune in then. Um, thank you and see you all again soon. Bye bye for now. Bye.